Chapter 2 Osteopathic Explorations Divisions of the Body After many long years treating and trying to teach the student of osteopathy how to hunt for and find the local causes of diseases, not contagious or infectious, I have succeeded in planning and suggesting a method which I am sure the doctor can easily follow and find any diversion from the normal that would interfere with the nerves, veins, and arteries of any organ or limb of the body. I have formulated a simple mental diagram that divides the body into three parts, chest, upper, and lower limbs. The first division takes in head, neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. The second division takes in head, neck, lower, and upper arm and hand. The third division takes in foot, leg, thigh, pelvis, and low lumbar vertebrae. I make this division for the purpose of holding the explorer to the limits of all supplies. In the ellipse of the chest is found all vital supplies. Then from that center of life we have two branches only, one of the arm and one of the lower limb. In each division we have five points of exploration. Searching for the cause. To illustrate, we will take the lower limb, whether there is lameness, soreness, gouty, rheumatic, neurologic, swollen, shrunken, feverish, cold, smooth, and glassy, sores, ulcers, erysipelas, milk leg, varicose veins, or any defect that the patient may complain of, who is the only reliable book or being of symptomatology. For convenience, we will divide that lower limb into five parts, the foot, leg, thigh, pelvis, and lumbar region. The patient, symptomatologist, tells us he has a pain in front, center, and under part of foot. Now the doctor, or bird dog, can find quails of reason in but one field that would lead him to the cause, as this field is divided into five parts and the hunter has carefully searched four divisions, he will find the cause or causes in the fifth and none other. If a dislocated bone is not found in the foot after ascertaining that there has been no crushing by falling bodies, horses, feet, stepping on glass, nails, and other things that would penetrate the foot and irritate by being broken off, closed, and remaining in the flesh, we will explore the leg for the quail, ascertain if the articulation is normal at ankle and knee. If we find the bone is not broken, the leg has no splinters of wood, nor injured flesh by bites from dogs or other animals, nor any other substance that would injure the leg. We are prepared to pass on and explore another place for pain in the foot. We go on to division number three, or the thigh division, and ascertain if the thigh is normal in all conditions, properly in socket with all muscles, ligaments, and nerves unoppressed. There are but two more divisions left for exploration, and they are the most important and interesting of the five, the pelvis and lumbar, through which all the nerves of the limb pass. We must stop at pelvis and observe carefully that there is no twist of ligaments before going to lumbar, which is the last of the five divisions. If we have found nothing in the previous four, and have explored them as carefully as we should, we have but one brush heap left and that one contains the quail that we have been hunting for. As the lumbar contains and conveys all nerve forces to the pelvis from the brain and all divisions of the lower limbs, we will now examine the articulations of that part of the spine, and in that we are very certain to find the cause if we have made no mistake in our examination in the preceding divisions of the limb. As we enter the exploration of this part of the spine, we must remember that we are about to deal with the many divisions of nerves of the cauda equana. The great question before us comes after this form. What would, what would wound or bruise any division of nerves that would lead by the way of the great or lesser sciatic to a bone in the front or under the side of the foot? Jars, strains, twists, and dislocations must be carefully searched for. A partial dislocation of one side of the spine would produce a twist which would throw one muscle on to another and another, straining ligaments, producing congestion and inflammation or some irritation that would lead to a suspension of the fluids necessary to the harmonious vitality of the foot, which is the great and only cause by which the suffering is produced in a foreign land, which we call a famine in the foot. Duty of the Osteopathic Explorer 
This method of exploration is not directed by the sound of the foghorns of unreliable and unsatisfactory symptomatology. Osteopathy has a method of its own, which is correct or it has no method at all, and is guided by the surveyor's compass that will find all corners as established by the orders of the government and surveyors general. Thus, an osteopath must find the truth corners as set by the divine surveyor. The general surveyor hands our plats and specifications to the division general with instructions to establish all lines and divisions, state, county, township, and sections, and mark each one by stones or otherwise, so they cannot be lost, but are findable by any competent surveyor who follows the field notes displayed in anatomy. Thus, you would see a successful osteopath is guided by the field notes of nature to all corners, his business is to know that every cornerstone is in its place, standing erect as nature designed and established it. If he tolerates any variation of this stone or stones from the place or places that God, the grand surveyor of the universe, has placed them, he will observe there is an infringement and cause for inharmony and discord of the possessors of the four quarter sections of land for which this cornerstone was placed, and his sworn duty is to bring this stone from any variation from the field notes and establish it where it was first placed. Thus, his ability to find the true corners and adjust all stones will mark him as a successful osteopath. Classification and Division I will classify or divide man's body for convenience of exploration for diseases into head and neck first, then head, neck, and chest third, head, neck, chest, and abdomen, then unite head, neck, chest, abdomen, and sacrum. I will take up a few diseases under each division as they are located. By this method, I think I can better show what nerves would be more or less active. The Abnormal A lesion may and does appear on a part or all of the person which may appear as a growth or withering away of a limb in all its muscles, nerves, and blood supply. As in case of tumors on scalp, loss of hair, eruptions of face, growth of tonsils, ulcers of one or both ears, gross on outside and inside of eyes, a cause must proceed in effect in all cases. A pain in head is an effect. Cause is older than the effect and is absolute in all variations from normal conditions. A tumor on the head and under the skin is an effect only. It took matter to give it size. It took power to deliver that substance. The fact that a tumor was formed shows that the power to build was present and did the work of construction. Another power should have been there to complete the work at that location. That power is the off-bearing of the dead matter after the work of construction was complete. Nerve Powers If we think as men of reason should, we will count five nerve powers. They must all be present to build a part and must answer promptly at roll call and work all the time. The names of these master workmen are sensation, motion, nutrition, voluntary, and involuntary. All must answer at every roll call during life. None can be granted a leave of absence for a moment. Suppose sensation should leave a limb for a time. Have we not a giving away of all cells and glands? An undue filling up follows quickly because sensation limits and tells when the supply is too great for the use of the builder's purpose. Suppose the nerve power known as motion should fail for a time. Starvation would soon begin its deadly work for want of food. Suppose again the nerves of nutrition should fail to apply the nourishing showers we would surely die in sight of food. With the voluntary nerves we move or stay at the will of he or she who wishes to give direction to the motor powers. At any time a change by action is required. At this time I will stop defining the several and varied uses of the five kinds of nerves and begin to account for gross and other variations, from the healthy to the unhealthy conditions of man. The above named are the five known powers of animal life, and to direct them wisely is the work of the doctor of osteopathy.